Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to our first evening for our Daniel and Revelation seminar. How many of us are excited to be here? Amen? Amen. How many of us are ready to learn about Daniel and Revelation and, and prophecy as well? Amen. How many of us here have ever read the book of Daniel or Revelation before? Okay, a few of us. When you read Daniel and Revelation before, how many of us uh, could remember what they read or understand what they read? Okay, so most of us didn't raise our hands on that one. So this is one reason why, by God's grace, we are here, is to help every one of us to learn in their walk, to learn more about Daniel and Revelation. So as we come to the meetings night after night, uh, we want to be familiar with the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation because they are supreme importance, especially for us living in the last days today. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. So before we begin, why don't we um, bow our heads for a word of prayer and then we'll go straight into the message. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, specifically to study Daniel chapter 2. Father, we realize that without you, we are nothing. And Father, we realize that without your spirit, spiritual things cannot be spiritually discerned. And so, Father, right now, we just want to plead for your presence. We want to ask and plead for your Holy Spirit to be our true teacher, that he may lead us and guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. O oh, Father in heaven, may you be lifted up this evening. May you hide me behind the cross, speak through me, and may you tailor make this message to each and every individual here this evening. For we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. This evening, uh, as you can tell, we are starting our first night of our Daniel and Revelation seminar. And um, praise God, I, I thank each and every one of you guys for making, out, making it out here to our first night. Our first night's uh, topic is entitled, The King's Dream. We're going to be looking at the King's Dream specifically in Daniel chapter 2. There, in this chapter, if you notice, you can open up your book to, to verify but there are almost 50 verses. How many verses? Almost 50 verses. There's actually about 49 verses in Daniel chapter 2. Now, we don't have the time to cover every single one of these verses, but we'll go over some key verses just so that we could understand what we are talking about. And so, for those who came to the Revelation Seminar, again, thank you all for coming and making it out. And now we'll begin our first presentation the king's dream. Now, there are two basic questions to ask um, when we study the Bible, and specifically when we're studying about prophecy. These are the very critical or most important questions that every single one of us must ask ourselves. If we do not ask these two questions, it is simply we're just reading pages in a book. These questions will help us to live out the words that are being said from God. And what are the two questions? The two basic questions, let's read this together on the screen. Ready, go. What practical lessons can we learn from Daniel? So when you're reading through Daniel, always keep in mind, what are the practical lessons? What are the practical tips that we can learn from studying this book? And number two, let's read it together. Ready, go. What can we learn about God's character? When studying Daniel and Revelation, we need to understand these two things. What practical lessons can I learn? And also, what about God's character? Who is God like? Because we're not here, we're not here just to study prophecy, to understand the times and the dates and the kingdoms and the beasts and the dragons. We're here to learn who Jesus is. Can you say amen? amen. We're here to learn tonight who is Jesus and what practical lessons can we learn from Jesus the book of Daniel, and also Revelation. Now, with that in mind, how many of us are all ready to study? Amen? 
I hope you guys brought your Bibles. I hope you guys brought a, a pen, a pencil, and, and some notes, uh, some paper, or you can take notes on your phone. Um, by the way, I, we will give you these slides um, at the end of the seminar. So uh, you guys can see pictures of the slides, but in the end, we will provide all the slides and materials so that you guys can enjoy studying the book of Daniel and Revelation. All right, ready to study? Okay, we're going to start off with an outline. A basic, simple outline of Daniel chapter 2. This is what the outline looks like. Here's basically a breakdown of Daniel chapter 2. You have, number one, the story. Number two, the, the praise. Number three, the dream. Number four, the interpretation. And number five, the promotion. Basically, this is when Daniel gets promoted to be one of the chief leaders in all of Babylon as a result of telling the king the dream and telling the king his interpretation. So are you guys ready to study now? Okay, let's go into the, let's go into the study. Let us look at the first thing, which is the story. And the story is found in Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 19. This is the story. We're going to go through it uh, on the screen, verse by verse, so that we can move a little bit faster. So let's start off with Daniel chapter 2 and looking at verse 1. The Bible says here, now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had what, everyone? Dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Now, how many of us have ever had a dream before and all of a sudden woke up from the dream because you were troubled? Okay, I, I, I see a few hands here. And when you ever had that dream before, uh, what did you do when you woke up, when you had a trouble, a troublesome dream? What was the first thing that you did? Okay, so I heard some people say pray. I heard some people say talk to someone about it. I heard someone say call the pastor. I heard someone say <laughs> tell your loved one about the dream. Well, this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he is the king of Babylon, and he has this dream that troubles him. Now, what does the Bible tell us that he did? Well, let's look at the next verse. In verse 2, it says, The king gave the command to call who? Magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his, his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. When the king had this dream, and he was troubled by the dream, what was the first thing that the king did? He sought for the, the people, he sought for his wise men in order to tell him what the dream was and what the interpretation was. Now this begs a, a very practical, powerful lesson, and here's a practical point. Let's read this together on the screen. Whenever you are troubled, don't call on men, but rather call upon God. Can you say amen to that? What did the king do? Did he call upon God when he was troubled by the dream? No, he didn't. What, who did he call? He called the magicians, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, the astrologers, all these quote-unquote wise men to tell the king what the dream was. But the king did a, did a terrible mistake. Instead of going to the God of all gods, the King of kings, he went to his wisest men. And all brothers and sisters, how many of us, whenever we are troubled, do we go to the God of gods and the King of kings? Amen? Or do we go to our sister, our brother, or maybe even our pastor? How many of us are following Jesus and asking for the guidance of God? Verse 3, the Bible continues, And the king said to them, I have had a what, everyone? A dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Have you ever felt anxious before? Yeah? Especially during uh, uh, final exam week, right? Are you guys anxious about knowing what, how you did? Your scores, your grades? Have you ever felt anxious before? Yes. And the king can totally relate to how you're feeling. He was very anxious about the dream. Next verse. Verse 4. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. 
tell your servants the what everyone? The dream, and we will give you the interpretation. Now, isn't this, isn't this funny? Isn't it, isn't it easier to give an interpretation rather than to tell what a person dreamed about? Yes? Of course. It's so easy to give an interpretation. Oh, king, just give me the dream, and I'll tell you the interpretation. Right? It's much more harder to tell the king, I know exactly what you dreamed of, and I will give you its interpretation. But the king wanted to know both the dream and the interpretation. Now notice what the king answered. He said in verse 5, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is what, everyone? Firm. What is firm? Decisive. I, I, strict. Kind of like firm tofu, right? You guys have firm tofu? It's very hard. This king was hard and he was firm. He said, if you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be what? Cut in pieces. What does cut in pieces mean? To be cut in pieces basically means to be pad thai. Pad thai. Not pad thai noodles, but something like that, yeah. Pad thai is basically, you're dead. You are cut in pieces. And not only them, not only the wise men, but it says, and whose houses? Your houses shall be made and an ash heap, meaning an ashes a result of burning. So in other words, your whole family will be burned into ashes. So this was this is what the decision was from the king. He, his decision was firm. His de de decision was if you do not tell me number one the dream and its interpretation, you will be patai. You will be you will be dead. But not only you, your houses shall be burnt up as well. So far, are we tracking? Amen? Now we want to ask the next question, um, which we already asked before. What are the two things that the king was desiring? Number one, the dream. And number two, the interpretation. These are the two things that the king wanted to know. This was on his heart, desire. Now, what two things would happen to the wise men of Babylon if they couldn't provide the king the dream and the interpretation. Okay, I heard Pad Thai, not the noodles. But they would die, number one, and number two, their families would die too through ashes or burning. They would be burnt up in the ashes, uh, burnt up with the fire, rather. So this is the result. And basically, what, what you're, if you summarize these two things, the two things that the king said that would happen to them is death. Can everyone say death? Ready? One, two, three, go. Death. He basically was going to give them a death decree, a death wish. And he said, you know what? If you can't tell me these two things, you're going to die. Now let's move on to verse 6. However, if you tell the dream and it's interpretation, you shall receive from me what everyone gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Question, what would the king give them if they provided the dream and interpretation? Gifts, rewards, and how many of us like gifts? How many of us like rewards? How many of us like great honor? Right? These were basically the things of the world in, in, in the kingdom of Babylon. This is what Babylon was known for. Babylon was known for gifts, rewards, and great honor. And you could also say, uh, having all these things, it's kind of like a sense of pride. It's kind of like, yeah, give me the honor, give me the praise, give me the gifts. And give me the honor, and I'm going to be famous. How many of us ever wanted to be famous before one time? We still want to be famous, right? These were the things that the king offered.
Now, I want to ask a very important question. Was Daniel present to hear about these, word, these awards? Was Daniel there when, when, when the king said, I'm going to give you gifts, great honor? Was he there? No. Daniel wasn't there. This means that Daniel wasn't moved by the riches of Babylon when he told the king his dream. He was not persuaded by, by whatever the king would give Daniel. He wasn't persuaded by whatever the king gave uh, to tell the dream. Like he, in other words, whatever the king offered, it did not affect Daniel. He wasn't moved by any of the riches of Babylon when he told the king his dream. Now let's move on in the story. Verse 7. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. Verse, verse 8. The king answered and said, I know for that you gain what everyone? You would gain time. Because you see that my decision is firm. What, 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 uh, what does that expression, gain time, mean? In our modern language like buying time right they were basically buying time here's here's the explanation to gain time is an expression of stalling or buying time the king knew he couldn't trust his wise men does that make sense so basically what the, what the wise men were doing is they were trying to buy time because the king, because the wise men knew that if they don't provide the two things that the king uh, wanted, they would be part time, right? So what did they do? They said, give us some time. They tried to gain time. They tried to stall. They tried to, to do all these things. Now what happens in verse 9? If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only how many decrees? One decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. What was that one decree that was meant for them? Pad Thai decree, right? Not the noodles, <laughs> but that they died. It was a death decree or a death penalty. Now, this one decree was the death decree pronounced upon them and their families. Is everyone tracking so far? Does this all make sense? Amen? Okay, we're going to move on. Also, the king used manipulation and force, which led to a death decree. He was asking them to do the impossible. Do you notice that the spirit of Babylon uses manipulation? If you don't provide this, then I'm going to kill you. But if you do provide this, then I'll give you rewards. I'll give you gifts. I'll give you great honor. Do you see the manipulation going on with the spirit of Babylon and the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar? Yes. This king was very manipulative and very forceful and very controlling at all. Let's move on. Verse 10, 11. The Chaldeans answered the king. There is what? Not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a what kind of thing? It is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except who? The God whose dwelling is where? is not with the flesh. Did you guys notice that? That it was a difficult thing. It was basically an impossible thing that the king was asking them to do. And how did they reason? How did they respond to the king? They said to the king, you know what? There is no one who can tell the king except who? The gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. What did the gods refer to? Did you know that Babylon worship idols images and pagan gods did you guys know that yes the, the babylon was basically basically a kingdom of idolatry they worship pagan gods they worship idols they worship images and in verse 12 and verse 13 it says it continues 
For this reason, the king was what, everyone? Angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. By the way, that word Babylon, does anybody know what that word Babylon means? Confusion. Good job. That comes from Genesis chapter 11 with the Tower of Evil, when God confused their language. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Could you imagine if you were Daniel, or if you were one of the, the, the friends of Daniel, and you heard about this decree that the king is about to kill every single one of the wise men, and you are considered one of the wise women during the kingdom of Babylon. How would you feel? How would you feel? You would feel scared, right? And what would you do? Would you try to run away? Would you try to fight? Or would you drop to your knees like how Daniel did? We're going to see what Daniel did later on. So, this is an interesting fact. A pagan god was known to not have any relationship with human beings. People simply just worshipped them to receive things from them. Like a soda machine, it provides thirst, but it never transforms our lives for the best. You see, the pagan gods that they worship and that they, they bow down to, they, they sacrifice uh, animals to, these idols were not real gods. These idols were fake gods, and these gods had no power in and of themselves. And not just that, but these pagan gods never had any relationship with the people here on earth. Does that make sense? Kind of helps understand? Okay. So, let's move on to, the, to the, the story. Then, with what everyone? Counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. Now, here's a question. Where did Daniel get his wisdom and counsel from? From who, everyone? From God. How do we know that? Because if you look in Daniel chapter 1, which is the previous chapter, you're going to see, there's, there's the whole context, you're going to see that Daniel was tested for 10 days. How many days? 10 days. And during these 10 days, God, uh, basically, uh, sorry, Daniel basically was faithful to God in the little things. And as a result, when he purposed in his heart, as Daniel 1 verse 8 says, that he would not defile himself with the king's drink and the king's meat, God, as a result, gave him wisdom and counsel and understanding. Can you say amen? amen? In Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, it says, As for these four young men, who gave them knowledge? God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had, what everyone? Understanding in all visions and dreams. Meaning to say, the only way that Daniel could, could know the dream and then give an interpretation of the dream was because of who, everyone? Was because of God. Because God is the one who provides the wisdom and the understanding to understand prophecy. How many of us today want to understand prophecy? How many of us want wisdom and understanding and knowledge to understand what Daniel and Revelation is all about? If we want this wisdom, all we have to do is simply just ask Him. Can you say amen? amen? If we just ask God, God would give us that wisdom and understanding that we don't understand in the, in the current times that we're living in. Amen? amen. Now, I want to point out something interesting about God's character. Here's God's character. Point number one. Let's read this together. Ready, set, go. God not only has wisdom and counsel... But he gives it to his children. Meaning to say that God doesn't just have wisdom and counsel. God has everything that you could ever imagine uh, of having, you know, a godly life. God has wisdom. God has might. God has strength. God has counsel. God has all these things. But then to see 
that God just have these things, He delivers or He gives those things to His children when they ask. Can you say amen? How many of us want wisdom and counsel from God this, this evening? All we have to do is ask. Amen? Now let's continue. Verse 15, 16. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so, so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him what everyone? Time. For what purpose? That he might tell the king the the interpretation. When Daniel was faced with a death, what did Daniel do? He asked for, what did he ask for? Time. Good job. He asked for time. Now let's move on. What did Ken, oh, well, already asked that question. Verse 18, verse 17 and 18. Then Daniel went to his house. Where did he go, everyone? He went to his house and made the decision known to who? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not, what everyone? Perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now I want to bring out a very practical point. Here's the point. Point number two. Let's read it on this screen. Ready? Go. Always have godly friends that you can trust and pray with. Amen? Amen. Did Daniel have friends that he could pray and trust? Yes, he did. If, if he had that friends, how about us? Shouldn't we have godly friends to pray with? <laughs> Daniel didn't try to talk to God alone. He sought friends to help him intercede to God. Why? Because more prayer, more, more power. When you have more prayer, praying for something, interceding for something, you can guarantee that there will be more power that will come out of that prayer. Can you say amen? Practical point number three. Let's read this on the screen. Ready? Go. When tested and tried, always resort to prayer and to seek the mercies of God. When you're going through final exams, when you're going through tough trials and tribulations, remember to always resort to prayer and to seek the mercies of God. Did Daniel do this? Daniel seek God in prayer, and did he seek after the mercies of God? Now let's look at the praise part. This is, this is one of the most exciting uh, things in the prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. It says here, Then the secret was revealed to who? To Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Did Daniel praised God. Yes, he did. Now here's something very interesting about God's character. Let's read this together. Ready, go. God hears and answers his children's prayer. Isn't that beautiful? God not only just hears your prayers, but he is able to answer that prayers. It may not be in the exact time that you wanted to answer, but, but little, uh, nonetheless, he's always answering his children's prayers. Can you say amen? Now, point number three about God's character. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. God is capable of revealing the secret things of life to his children. Isn't that beautiful? What kind of a God do we serve? We serve a God who is capable of revealing the secret things of life. Meaning, today, if we don't understand Daniel and Revelation, God is willing and capable and able to give you light and understanding. Can you say amen? Now, in Daniel chapter 2, 21, it says, and he changes the times and the seasons. Basically, Daniel is giving a resume of who God is. Here's the resume. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He 
knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. This was the resume that Daniel gave about the God that he served. He was telling this to King Nebuchadnezzar and he was telling it to Arioch and all the people there standing in the court. And he's basically praising God and he's saying, look at my God whom I serve. This is the God that I serve. He is able to do all these things. Won't you still serve him? Won't you still love him? Amen? Daniel chapter 20, uh, 2, verse 26, it says, The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, basically that's a pagan name for Daniel, Are you able to make known to me the what everyone? The dream which I have seen and its interpretation. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, cannot, what everyone, declare to the king. He's basically telling the king, oh, you know, your wise men that you had chosen, they don't know anything. But there is someone who knows it. Notice what it says next. But there is a Daniel on earth. Is that what the Bible says? There is a Daniel on earth. Is that what the Bible says? No. What does it say? There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Not a Daniel on earth. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the what days? In the latter days last days. Your dream and the visions of your head, uh, 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 your head upon your bed were these. Now he begins to tell the dream in the next verse. But I want to bring on a very practical point about God. Let's read it together on the screen. Ready? Go. God loved the evil king so much that he gave him a vision so that he could wake up from his spiritual slumber. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Isn't that the grace of God? That God would choose an evil king and say to the evil king or tell the evil king, hey, you know what? I have a dream for you. I'm going to give you the dream, but not just the dream. I'm going to give you the interpretation of the king. Now, I want you to put yourself in, in King Nebuchadnezzar's shoes. This king is an evil, wicked king. He worships uh, pagan gods. He worships idols. He worships images. And he rejects the God of heaven. And this king was given the opportunity by God for him to know a dream from God. Now, isn't that a beautiful thought? That God would choose the most wickedest king on earth to relay to him a message from heaven. Amen? Now, let's read this other point. Uh, this is a practical point. This is one of my favorite points in Daniel chapter 2. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. When you can kneel before God, you can stand up amongst kings. Isn't that beautiful? When you can kneel before God, you can stand up amongst anyone that comes to you. Amen? Because you know that God is by your side. Amen? Now, we're going to look at the dream. Daniel chapter... 2, verses 19 to 31 and 30 to 36. We're going to look at the dream really quickly. I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to press for time, but here we go. Here's the dream. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a what, everyone? Why is this so important to King Nebuchadnezzar? Because what did the king worship in the past? Images, idols, pagan gods. How did God speak to the mind of King Nebuchadnezzar? Through a great image. This caught his attention. And God, God only knew that the only way I can speak to this king is not by telling him about a lion, you know, a beast, or a dragon, but the way to speak to the king is through what he worships. And that what he worships is images, idols, or pagan gods. Because later on in the dream, He's going to see a picture of this, of this statue 
And at the end, I'm probably going ahead of myself here, but at the end, what happens to this great image? A rock comes and it destroys, it disintegrates this great image. It was speaking to the king that one day your idol worship will stop. And one day you will worship the God of heaven. Amen? Amen. God was trying to get the king's attention to this great image. This great image, whose splendor was what, everyone? Excellence stood before you. And its form was was awesome. This, this is beautiful words that the king is hearing. And then it goes on, verse 32. This image head was of what? Fine gold. Its chest and arms of? Its belly and thighs of? Its legs of? Its feet partly of? And partly of? You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the water, everyone. The image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. This here is basically the dream. Okay, this is what you dreamt. This is what you dreamt of. But the king, the, the dream is not over. There's a part two to it. Here's the part two. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was. Basically, this image was, was destroyed. It was disintegrated. It was cut in pieces. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now I'm going to tell you the interpretation of the dream for the king. How many of us are tracking so far? Amen? Amen. The dream, this is what the king dreamed. He dreamt of a great image. And at the end of this great image, there was a stone that came and it struck the feet of the image and all of a sudden, the image was totally destroyed. It was had died. Does that make sense, everyone? Not the noodles, but it was dead. It was killed. Okay, so now let's move on. Now we're going to look at the interpretation. Here, what, what does the, the dream represent? Here's the interpretation. It says here, You, O king, are a king of kings for the what of heaven? The God of heaven has given you a kingdom. Who gave King Nebuchadnezzar the kingdom? It was God. The king should have already realized who God was. That the God of heaven gave the king his kingdom. But not just the kingdom, it's power, it's and, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them what? Into your hands and has made them made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. What does the gold represent? The kingdom of the kingdom of Babylon. The king of Nebuchadnezzar is was the king of Babylon. So here we see the head of gold simply represents the kingdom of Babylon. Now, does the kingdom of Babylon live forever? No. How do we know that? Because the next verse it says, "After, but after you, king of Babylon." shall arise a what? Another kingdom inferior to yours. So does the kingdom of Babylon last forever? It doesn't. Because it's telling us that there's another kingdom that would come inferior to yours. Now who is or what is that kingdom? In order to understand that, we need to understand the story of Belteshazzar. How many of us have ever read uh, or heard about the story of the writing on the wall? Have you guys? Okay, a lot of hands. I see the hands. Okay. So basically, here's the story. I'm not going to read it because I know we're pressed for time, but basically, this is what happens. King Belshazzar, which was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, had a fiesta. You guys know what a fiesta is? Had a big party. And at his party, they were drinking wine in the presence of thousands. 
and they drank wine and they praised the gods of what everyone? Gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. And in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Basically, he saw something, there was a hand writing something. The king saw the part of the hand that he wrote. Now, notice what the next verse says. What did he read on the wall? This is what he read. And this is the inscription that was, that was written. Let's read this, everyone. Ready? Go. Mene, mene, teko, you farsin, or perez. Does anybody know what this, this word means? We don't have to guess because the Bible tells us. In chapter 5, it, verse 26, it says, This is the interpretation of each word. Many. God has what? Numbered your kingdom and? Many just simply means your kingdom has come, is coming to an end. Your kingdom had time. Your kingdom is about to be uh, delivered or conquered by another, by another uh, nation. Teko, you have been weighed in the balances and? What does that expression weighed in the balances and found wanting mean? It basically means they were in sin. How do we know they were in sin? What did they have at the, at the fiesta? They were drinking wine, they were drinking alcohol, and they were worshipping idols. Teko simply means you have been weighed in the balances and found one thing. You have been found sinful and guilty. And Paris, what does Paris mean? It says, your kingdom has been divided and given to who everyone? The Medes and the Persians. Who is the nation that conquers Babylon? Medo-Persia. We see it from Scripture. We don't have to look at history. The Bible interprets itself. Can you say amen? So here we have the chest and arms of silver represent what kingdom, everyone? Medo-Persia. Now what about the third kingdom? The Bible says here in Daniel 2, but then another, a third kingdom of, of what, everyone? Bronze, which shall rule over the earth. Now what is this of bronze represent? Well, in the same story, in Daniel chapter 8, not the same story, sorry, in Daniel chapter 8, we see, we're going to talk about this in our future date, we see uh, basically two wild beasts fighting each other. You have a ram and a he goat. A what, everyone? A ram and a he goat. They come together and they start to attack each other. They start to fight, right? Now, what does the ram and the he-goat represent? Daniel 8 tells us. Let's read, this. Let's read this together. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him. He attacked the ram and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hands. Who won here, the ram? It was the goat. The goat ram. Now, the question is, here's the, the million dollar question. Who does the ram represent? And who does the goat represent? Does anybody know? The Bible will help us understand this. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, the Bible says, The ram which you saw having the two horns are the kings of Medo-Persia, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. That first king of Greece is none other than Alexander the Great. So who were the, who were the two nations fighting amongst each other? It was the kingdom of Medo-Persia and, and who won? Greece won. Who is this third kingdom? The, cur the third kingdom of bronze represents Greece. Now we're going to go to the fourth kingdom. We're almost done here. It says here, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as what everyone? Iron. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Is iron a strong metal? Yes. Does iron kill people? Iron can kill people, right? 
Now notice who this, notice uh, in order to understand who the, the, the power of the fourth kingdom is, we need to understand the context here. Here's the context. It says in Daniel chapter 2, it, it says here, but then another, a third kingdom of bronze, who is the third kingdom of bronze, by the way? Greece. Shall rule how many of the earth? Does it say part of the earth? How many of the earth? All of the earth. This is a big clue to understanding who the fourth kingdom is from Scripture. The reason why is because in Luke chapter 2 verse 1, the Bible gives us something interesting. It says here, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from who, everyone? Caesar Augustus. Who is Caesar Augustus the king of? The king of Rome. That how many of the world should be registered? If the kingdom of Rome conquered Greece, which Greece had conquered the earth, oh sorry, let's say that again. If Greece had conquered the whole entire world, the kingdom that conquers Greece should be a kingdom that conquers all the world as well. Does that make sense? If that is the case, then who is Caesar Augustus? He's the king of, of Rome. He's the king of Rome. Does that make sense? And in order for the whole world to be registered, you have to conquer the whole entire world. Did Rome conquer Greece? Yes, it did. The fourth kingdom of iron is none other than, than Rome. The Bible is clear about this. Now, what happens next? Whereas you saw the feet and toes, Partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what, everyone? Does the kingdom of Rome get conquered from another nation? Does the kingdom of Rome get conquered from another nation? No. What is the kingdom of Rome? It's, it's divided. It's divided, and we're going to see later on, it's divided into ten kingdoms, ten, ten nations. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now there's something interesting. I'm going to read to you a quote from four, <coughs> Bible Commentary, page 1168. It says here, this is very interesting. We have come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was fixed with the miry clay. Now notice what she says next. The mingling of what everyone? Churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. This union is weakening all the power of the churches they have invested their strength in politics and have united with the, the papacy or papacy. So, what is the what is the iron mixed with clay all about? There is a mingling of church and state. Does anybody know why this is so important? Here's why. Babylon, if you, were to, if you were to break down the kingdoms that is represented here on the screen into two things, it would be this. One, political, and two, religious. What are the two things again? Number one, political, and number two, religious. The kingdom of Babylon was primarily a kingdom that was political. The kingdom of Medo-Persia was primarily political. The kingdom of Greece was primarily political. The kingdom of Rome was primarily political. The, then you have the iron and the clay which represents the div divided Rome, the divisions of Rome. All of a sudden Rome is not conquered but Rome is divided. And then later on then you see that the iron mixed with the clay represents church and state uniting with each other. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. So basically, this is what the king dreamed of. And this was the interpretation of the dream.
was done here. It says, Inasmuch as you saw the stone was cut out from the mountain without hands, that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is, is sure. So let's, let's review again. Let's read it on the screen. The head of gold represents? Chest and arms of silver represent? Belly of bronze? Legs and thighs of iron? Iron and clay? Stone? And mountain? Just to give you uh, the timing of it, this is, this is the time that Babylon, uh, from Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, all the way to now. Where are we according to the timeline of the image? We are living in this time. This, this has not taken place yet. Has the second coming taken place yet? No, it hasn't. We're living in the time. It's basically, people say, we're living in the toenails of time. <laughs> living in a time where the next greatest event is that Jesus is coming back soon. Are you ready for his coming? Now let us review all our practical points on the screen. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Whenever you are troubled, don't call on men, but rather call upon God. Number two. God hears and answers his children's prayer. Number three, when tested and tried, always resort to prayer to seek the mercies of God. Number four, when you can kneel before God, you can stand up amongst kings. Isn't that wonderful, friends? How many of us want to live like Daniel did? There's a song called Dare to Be a Daniel. Have you guys heard of that song before? I wish I could sing it, but I'm not a good singer. But it basically says, dare to be a Daniel. Prepare to stand alone. Dare to... And dare to... Man. How many of us want to be like Daniel? But most importantly, how many of us want to be like Jesus? The only way we could be ready for that second coming, that stone that strikes the image moment, is if our hearts are right with Jesus. How many of us want Jesus this evening? Let's read together on the screen. The points ready, set, go. Number one, God not only has wisdom and counsel, but he gives it to his children. Number two, God hears and answers his children's prayers. Number three, God is capable of revealing the secret things of life to his children. Number four, God loved the evil king so much that he gave him a vision so that he could wake up from his spiritual slumber. Oh, brothers and sisters, how many of us are so thankful for the God that we serve. God is not only uh, interested in His children, but He's also highly interested in those who do not know who Jesus is. Perhaps you don't know who Jesus is. Perhaps you don't know Him fully enough to be ready for a second coming, and you realize that you want to be ready for Jesus to come. If that's your desire, ask me to stand with me as we go Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for never giving up upon us. Lord, many times we are just like the king. We're doing evil things. Perhaps we're worshiping other gods. Maybe not literal gods, but gods of, of the things that we, we have and watch and observe every single day. Father in heaven, whatever that idol, whatever that image, or whatever that uh, God that we're serving, 
Lord, Father in heaven, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the victory over those things. That you would break us from the chain of sin. And that you would give us everlasting life. Oh, Father in heaven, we realize that without Jesus, we are nothing. And Father, we want to be ready for your second coming of Jesus. And oh, Lord, perhaps some of us are not ready. If Jesus was to come this evening, perhaps many of us would be saying, Lord, mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of Jesus. Oh Lord, help us, Lord, not to be like that, but help us to be the ones who look up in the, uh, the, the sky and say, Lord, this is our God, whom we have waited for, and He shall be able to deliver us. Oh Father in heaven, we want to be ready for your second coming. We want to have a deep relationship with you. Please help us Give us a desire to want to spend time with you every morning. Give us a desire to want to pray like how Daniel prayed. And give us a desire to share what we've learned from you to someone who don't know Jesus. This is our humble prayer. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen.